Okay, uh, good afternoon. So my name is Kaustub and I'll be picking up where Yogesh left, which is to actually get you into Python rather than talk about why you should be using Python. So I hope you are sufficiently motivated now that you want to use Python. Now before I actually begin my presentation, there are two uh, rants that I want to do before I start the presentation. Now some of you who may have attended a similar course before and the fact that you will attend a second one. Uh, but one important thing I must tell you, this is from experience, I'm sure many of you will agree with this, is if you define the usefulness of a course as follows, at the end of the course you will become a great programmer, then any course on earth is useless. There's only one way you can learn a language which is to keep practicing. So I know many people who attended the prior courses but are not anywhere close to being called Python programmers for the simple reason that they haven't ever programmed in Python, they just read or heard. So follow that rule, ABC, always be coding. To help you with that, we are giving you a bunch of assignments and do try and take one of your favorite programs from other language which you regularly use and translate into Python. That's the only way you can really learn. The second uh, important advice I'd give you is ASYC, always share your code or show your code because especially with Python, it is a fact that you cannot translate from another language into Python and be happy with it. So you might be aware of C or C++ or Fortran, but if you are going to translate your C language program into Python as is, it won't be a good program because Python is a very high level language which means it offers you one line equivalents of what would take 10 to 15 lines to achieve in Fortran or C or C++. So do watch out for this and if you are not showing or sharing your code with other people and getting opinions, there are some things you'll never learn, especially in Python because of its very shorthand notations for some very complicated stuff that you would otherwise do in a language. So on that note, let me begin. So these are the topics I'll be covering today in no specific uh, order. We'll talk about basic input, output, data types, programming philosophy, what happens under the hood when you execute a Python program, conditionals, loops, and the basics of objects and uh, methods. Now I'm going to assume that you're not new to programming. What I mean by that is I'll throw jargon around freely. I'll very freely say variables, Boolean expressions, blah, blah, blah. If you find that I'm using some word which you're not able to follow, please feel free to interrupt me and get it clarified. Okay, this would have been uh, commented on by Yogesh in the last class whether we'll be learning Python 2 or 3. So I'll be taking this entire, I'll be giving all these talks from the point of view of Python 2 and not 3. The reason for that is as follows. The key strength of Python or the main reason why we use Python is because of its third party libraries which allow you to do all kinds of things. Manipulate FITS files, make plots, do machine learning, whatever. Now, many of these are not yet ready, and even if they have been translated into Python 3, they are not optimized in performance. And that is why the community at large uses Python 2, but that is changing very soon. So you should keep track of the progress that's happening and migrate to 3 when the community starts migrating to Python 3. Now, there are three links. You will get these PDFs so you don't have to note them down. There are three links that I'm providing here. The first two links are guides as to how you move from Python 2 to Python 3. And the third is a list of packages that are available in Python 3. So the first link is actually a PDF file, which is a comparison of syntax between Python 2 and 3. So if you're writing this in Python 2, what is the equivalent you should be writing in Python 3 is uh, clearly given in, these four, in this four-page document. Then the second link is an online IPython notebook by this person, Sebastian Rashka. And uh, you should follow this person because he puts up a lot of informative posts on Google Plus especially. He has his own, uh, 
feed where he posts a lot of interesting information and comparisons between algorithms. And he has created a well documented, uh, he has given a detailed explanation of what is it that you do in Python 2 and how it changes in Python 3. So we'll come back to this again. Then the third link is to a page called the Python Package Index. So these are all the packages that you can install in uh, Python. Now on the left here, you will find a link that says Python 3 packages, which takes you, which takes you to this list of packages that are available in Python. So you will find that AstroPy, Matplotlib, NumPy, SciPy, they are all there. So you can use Python 3 there. But if you are aware of some affiliated packages in Python th uh, in AstroPy, like Ginga, which is a widget for viewing FITS files. So if you need to design a FITS viewer for your own observatory, you will take Ginga as a starting point and then customize it. Or there is something called APLPy, which allows you to layer contours on top of FITS images, like isophotal contours or maybe DS9 regions. And these uh, and libraries like these are not yet ready for Python 3. So just for the sake of these libraries, it's painful to come back to Python 2. That's why we will start with Python 2. And when everything is ready and nobody will use Python 2 anymore, we will use one of the first two links to actually start porting code to Python 3. There is another site which is called pi3readiness.org. So this site is a collection of top 360 most used uh, modules in Python. And you'll see that the modules that are already ported to Python 3 are in green and those in white are the ones that are not yet ported. So this will also allow you to make a decision about whether you want to use Python 2 or Python 3. Also here there is here a script provided written by Brett Cannon which allows you to write a list of packages in a text file and run a program and it will tell you whether all those modules are available in Python 3 or not. So that's another way you can check if you want to use Python 3 or Python 2. Okay. So let's start by writing our first uh, program. This is pretty simple. This will be our program and this will be the output it gives. Maybe they should mute from that side. Okay. They should mute their microphone from that side. Okay, so this will be our program and this will be the output. So I want to show you how you write a Python program and execute it. So I'll start by using any text editor of my choice. Now for saving time, I've already written this, but assume that I just wrote all this uh, in front of you. So I've typed all this, and now I'll save and quit. And to execute, all I will say is Python, followed by the name of the file, and press Enter. That's it. It's as easy as that to execute a Python program. You type it in a text file with a .py extension, and then you say Python file name .py.
Okay. Fine. So that's our program, and let's see how see what all that program teaches us about Python. First thing that Python is dynamically typed. If you are writing this program in C or C++ or Java or Fortran, your first few statements will be like int, abc, float, xyz, and so on. So in all these languages, you need to predefine the variables that you are going to use and also the type of data that they will store. In Python, we don't need to do anything of that type, of that sort. We just the variables get created the first time they are assigned a value, and the type is decided by the value itself. So 3, for example, will be an integer. 3.0 will be a float. Now, the other important feature is that Python is also a strongly typed language. What we mean by that is if variables do not exist, any attempt to refer to them will result in an error. This is not true with Perl, for example. Perl is a weakly typed language. So if you use a variable that does not exist, Perl will not complain. It will just substitute some default value, 0 for numbers and an empty string for strings, and it will carry on the calculation. But Python does not allow you to do that. You have a variable should exist if you want to refer to it, and the existence is decided by just assigning a value to it. Okay, so then commenting. Anything after the hash symbol is a comment. And good programs are the ones that have a lot of comments in them. So you please use that option freely. Next is the print statement. Now if you even write a program that just prints hello world, it will not work in Python 3. Because in Python 3, there is no such thing called a print statement. There is a print function. So that is made clear by one of the pages that I had opened. So this will all work in Python 2. But for Python 3, you will have to make a function call for it to work. Now, strangely, you will see that this seems to work. So does it mean that print is both a, py is, is both a function as well as a statement in Python 2? No. This happens to be a tuple. Oh, sorry, this happens to be an expression consisting of one string. So there the brackets actually say that it's an expression, while the brackets here tell that it's a function call. So the clever trick you can use to make sure that your program is compatible across Python 2 and 3, as far as print statements are concerned, is to write all your print statements with a bracket. And that will ensure that at least that aspect of your program will not break when you use Python 3. Next, we saw assignments of this form. This is allowed in Python. You can say a comma b is 5 comma 6. That puts 5 in a and 6 in b. Now, there are many more complicated forms of doing these kind of assignments in Python 3, which I will not cover. But I am just informing you that there are plenty of options available for these kind of assignments in Python 3. So do try and look that up. The other thing that is obvious is the behavior of the slash and percent operators in the program. So let's take a look at that program. So because a and b are integers, a slash b will produce a quotient, while a mod b or a percent b will produce a remainder. Okay, Even that changes in Python 3. In Python 3, a slash b will give you the full value. So 3 by 2 will give you 1.5, not 1. So in Python 3, if you want a quotient, you have to use two slashes. So a slash slash b will give you a quotient in case of integers. Okay. The other feature is that there are no termination symbols at the end of any Python statement. Pressing the Enter key tells Python that you have moved to a new line. You don't have to put a semicolon and then write the next statement. The only exception to this is Python also allows you to write small statements all on one line, in which case they must be separated by a semicolon. So that's the only time a semicolon is used in Python. Okay. Now let's see what's happening when I actually run a Python program. 
See, first of all, you must notice that there is no explicit compiling and linking step as we do in C or Java. There is no intermediate step of first creating an executable and then running it. You just say Python name of the program and it runs. Internally, the program is translated into a machine independent format called the bytecode. So these, this may appear, depending on your read and write permissions, as .pyc files in the folder where you are running this program. So .pyc files are the bytecode version of your program. Now this process of translation and executing a single statement happens line by line. So what that means is if you have a program with n plus 1 lines and the first n lines are error free and there is a bug on the n plus 1 line, Python will execute n lines and then say, oh, I found a bug on n plus 1 line, which can be a source of frustration if you are not programming carefully. The other implication is that you get an interactive shell to play with. So let's see what the interactive shell looks like. So to start the interactive shell, I'm just going to say Python and press the enter key. I'm not going to give a file name. And I'm greeted with this prompt comprising of three greater than symbols. So I can just type any statement in Python and it gets executed. And the output comes immediately. That's why you call it an interactive shell. As soon as I type, I get the output. So instead of actually writing a whole bunch of statements and asking Python to execute them, I can execute one by one and immediately see the output. And this is something you want to do in typical data analysis. You want to carry out a step, see the results, then decide what you want to do. So that's why Python becomes a favorite among astronomers for data analysis, one of the reasons. Okay. Now this interactive shell is so important that it actually rids the need of having an IDE. So you have something like Eclipse for Java. People, Java programmers almost can't live without it. Python programmers don't need an IDE because whenever they need, they can actually test their fragments of code in the interactive shell and then incrementally develop their program. So that is the reason why people decided to enhance it and make it better, and that led to the uh, existence of IPython. So I'm going to say Control D to get out of this, and then type IPython. Now, very important, the Python default interactive shell will come as is. I mean, with Python, it ships by default. But IPython is something you need to install separately, unless, of course, you're installing a bundled package of Python which ships with all kinds of libraries, including the IPython shell. So the IPython shell is clearly different. You have numbered input lines, which MATLAB users will immediately recognize. And I can do the same things I can do with the other shell, which is type and get instant results like this. Now, one of the differences is you can refer to the previous output. So let's see, if I say A plus 55, the third output is now 59. So I, if I want to do something with 59, so all I have to do is say underscore plus 56, let's say. So here the underscore ref refers to the previous output. Double underscore will refer to the second last output. And you can go up to three last outputs in this way, not more than that. If you need to refer to any output with some specific number, say I want to refer to output number three, I can say underscore three, let's say I will say plus zero, 59. Why? Because underscore three refers to out three. Okay. I can also refer to the input statement by saying underscore i3 and it gives me a string which says this is the statement that you executed. And if you want to execute that statement again, I can say exec and I can say 
so exact oh, wow yeah so underscore i3 refers to the input statement which is numbered 3 and exec is a function that executes a string as if it were a statement and since it was just an assignment we are not getting any output so that's how the uh, ipython shell works now what is important is you can all you don't have to have a separate terminal window to do your basic linux uh, commands some of them will work as is so you can do ls and pwd etc all from within ipython if you need to launch a program like let's say i want to launch gvim from within ipython shell i'll just say exclamation mark and then give the name of the program and it will launch gvim okay so i'll tell you more about ipython as we uh, go along but let's first now take the first tour of the data types available in python we'll start with numbers that is integers and floats and then study the math module a bit then move on to strings which will be a very detailed topic involving these five subtopics okay so one of the things you already have seen integers in action you can add them you can subtract you can divide you can find the remainder let's learn another operator which is the double star it stands for it is basically exponentiation so 8 star star 2 is 8 square which is 64 now one of the specialities of the integer type in python is that it can be arbitrarily long but by default it is implemented as a 32 bit or a 64 bit integer depending on your configuration but if i try something like this 23 power 100 which clearly cannot be accommodated using a standard integer python upgrades the integer type into what is called a long integer a python long integer which can be arbitrarily long so the, and it will indicate by appending an l at the end that this is not a ordinary integer but a special integer that python is using to represent that larger number and of course you know what the slash and percent symbols do they stand for quotient and remainder respectively okay floats so which one is a float and which one is a integer here huh? so we are not telling python what variable to use so how are we going to tell python what is a float and what is an integer it's by the representation so 2 here is an integer while 5.0 is a float and when i'm multiplying these two python will give you the result in whatever is the higher uh, type of variable so in this case the float is a larger or a more a higher type than an integer so you are going to get the answer as 10.0 you can also do exponentiation with floats and get do things like 5 power 0.5 which is basically square root of 5 however if you try to do a division this time you will no longer get a quotient you will get the full fledged answer which in this case happens to be 1.25 the remainder will work as is so can you think of why 5 mod 4.1 should be 0.9 but why 0.9 how do you arrive at 0.9 is the question so you take 4.1 find the largest number you can largest integer that you can multiply it with to get an answer which is less than or equal to 5 and in this case it happens to be 4.1 so the difference is 0.9 so that's how the remainder is defined so it works with floats as well okay so we know how to write numbers in python let's do some complicated operations with them now the ready made functions are not available as is in python you need to import a math module to make them available because it's obvious that not every python programmer will use the math module generally scientists are going to use it more than let's say web developers so the entire set of math functions are, is kept in a separate module called the math module now a module can be thought of as a collection of related functions so 
For example, matplotlib is a module which is a collection of functions that help you plot. Similarly, the math module will be a collection of functions that help you do all kinds of math. So to make a module available in Python, you say import followed by the name of the module. And when you want to use a function inside that module, you will use the dot notation. You will say module name dot followed by the function and provide the inputs in the bracket. So let's see how the math module works. I'll say import math to tell Python that I want to use that module. Then I'm going to say x equal to 45 times math.py by 180. But it turns out that a module not only stores functions, but can also store constants. And pi happens to be, well, pi, which you can always access using the math module. You don't have to define a pi at the top of your program when you need to use it. So all this is doing is it will store the radians equivalent of 45 degrees in x, and then I can call math dot sine of x to get the value of sine of 45. That's it. Well, that tells you another thing about the sine that it accepts the argument as radians and not degrees. So you need to read the documentation to un to make these things clear because this can be a constant source of errors in your program. You will assume you are passing. Uh, degrees, but what it needs is radians and so on. Okay, so there is a ready-made function available. Sorry. Yes, yes, by default. So I can also nest functions. So in this case, I'm saying math dot sine of math dot radians of 45. So how this works is the innermost function is executed first. So 45 is passed to radians, which converts. 45 degrees to the radians equivalent, and that output becomes an input to the sine function, and you get the same answer as this. Now, there are about 42 functions in the math library, the basic math library. Obviously, you can't remember all of them, and you don't want a book besides you to keep opening and checking which function is available. Well, you don't need to do that. You just go to your interactive Python shell, import the math module and say print dir of math, and it gives you a list of all variables inside math. Now, notice that the first few variables begin with underscores. Now, those are special variables. You always ignore them unless you are a developer. We are interested from a cos onwards because those are the variables that do not begin with the underscore. So these are all the functions or constants available in the math library. So if, I, if something catches my eye, let's say HyPod, for example, I want to know what it does. I just have to type help of math.hypod, and it gives me an inbuilt documentation on that function. So in this case, it gives me square root of x square plus y square for x and y that I give to HyPod. Simple. Now in IPython, it becomes even easier. I just say import math. Then I type math dot. And now I'll press the tab key. And it gives me a list of all functions available within the math module. If I type C, for instance, C, and then press a tab, it gives me only those functions that begin with C. If I say COP and tab, since the only function that begins with COP is copy sign, it will auto complete for me. And when I want the help, I don't type help off. I just put a question mark, press enter. And it tells me what is the data type of this. So it's a built in function, and it tells the syntax is like this copy sign of x, comma y, and it returns x with the sign of y. So that's what the copy sign function is designed to do. Now, in this case, if I type two question marks, I'm going to get exactly the same output. But if the source code of that function was available, then double question mark would display the source code of that function to you. So if you want to go in depth and understand why the function is doing some things that you don't understand of for some reason, you can just use the double question mark to see the source code, provided it is available. If it's not available, then this will just display, do the exact same thing as a single question mark does. So let's move from numbers to strings. 
So you all know that strings are just collections of characters. And there are three basic methods by which you can define strings in Python. In the first method, I am using double quotes to define a string. In the second method, I am using single quotes to define a string. The alternate ways of doing A and B are these two. So let us understand what I am trying to show here. So let us say that I wanted to define A exactly like this but using single quotes. What would I do? I would say single quotes, John. But now see the single quote is confusing. If I had not put a slash here, that single quote would be interpreted by Python as the end of the string. And everything else after that is meaningless and it will throw up an error. So I need to explicitly put a backslash there to tell Python that, hey, this quote doesn't mean the end of the string. It's an actual quote. It's a literal quote that I want it to be a part of the string. But you see, if I'm using double quotes, I get rid of all those problems. Same here. I'm using this double quotes inside the string. If I had declared this exact string with double quotes, I would put all kinds of backslashes to in order to escape the meaning of those characters. So you can use any of these ways to declare a string in Python. You can also declare an arbitrarily long string by using three double quotes. So I'm just putting three double quotes, then I start writing as if it's a text editor, okay? And if I had to write this exact string in the traditional way, I would have written it like this. The slash n stands for a new line. So I'm saying slash n, slash n, then this slash n, slash n, and so on. Okay. From this syntax, there's another thing which is, uh, I mean, sorry, I wanted to say that these triple quotes are most used in two cases. One is you can actually use Python to build up scripts that other interpreters or compilers could use. For instance, I can have Python build up a HTML page in this way. Obviously, you don't want to write an HTML page using this approach. You would rather write using this approach. And then you can pass it to whatever browser or something and it will pass that HTML and display the page for you, for example. The other important use of these uh, doc strings, as they are called, so the triple quoted strings are called doc strings, is to document functions and modules. So I'll show you in on the in the Monday class how that can be done. Okay. We can also do string arithmetic. So here I have defined two strings, hello and world, and if I say s1 plus s2 and print it, I get just the concatenated version. So hello and string are just appended side by side and a new variable is created. I can also say s1 into 3. So that is taken as repeat three times. So you get hello, hello, hello. I can combine the two operations. So if I say s1 into 3 plus s2, I get hello, hello, hello world. You cannot do s1 into s2 because that has no meaning. Python does not know how to do that operation or rather the creators of Python didn't know what to what to do, may make sense of this kind of an operation, so that is not defined. You will get an error if you try that. Yes? Two choices, you can either put uh, extra space after O or before W or you can say S1 plus quote space quote plus S2. There is another way to do it, but I will be uh, so this works something like this. Sorry. But since I have not covered these topics, I do not want to go into the details of this, but this is another way you can join strings with spaces in between. So the string is a sequence. So sequence is so sequence in Python is anything that is ordered. So it has well-defined positions for each element of that object. 
So if I say a equal to python rocks, then I can define the first element of this string as a of 0. So if I say what is a of 0, 1 and 2, it gives me the first, second and third elements of this string. So this is how you refer to elements inside a collection, an ordered collection. So there are unordered collections in python as well, we will talk about that tomorrow. I can also say a of minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. The negative indices are interpreted as first last, second last and third last elements of that string. So here it is displaying exclamation s and k. I can check the length of the string by simply typing len of a and it tells me it is 13, it counts white space as well. So if you had a new line character that would be counted as one single character too. Then you can do something called slicing with ordered collections. So I can say something like a 2 colon 6. What that means is construct a new string using a of 2, a of 3, a of 4, a of 5, but not a of 6. Beginners usually get confused with this part of slicing that the last element is not included. So 6 is not included. So a of 6 will not appear here. Okay. Now people do tend to ask why was it made like this. I mean it is very confusing, but I can assure you that if you write Python programs for next few months, you will be happy that the creators decided that this was the way to make slices behave. Okay. So I can say a of 8 colon minus 2, that works. All that is saying is a of 8, a of 9, all the way up to a of minus 2. I can skip arguments to the slice. So if I say a colon 5, I have not put anything here before the colon. So default 0 is assumed by Python. So this prints all the way from the beginning of the string up to a of 4, not 5. Okay. I can skip the second index as well. So a of 5 colon would be from a of 5 all the way to the end of the string. Is that okay? You have even crazier slices as far as ordered collections are concerned. I can write something like a 1 colon 6 colon 2. So that will give me a of 1, 3 and 5. So it is skipping in steps of 2 starting from 1 up to less than or equal to the last index. So I am just printing these 3 for comparison just to show you this is how it works. Again I can skip indices here too. I can say a colon colon 2 and it goes from beginning to end in steps of 2. I can also say a colon colon minus 1. Minus 1 means a negative step. So it reverses a string. So this is what I was talking about earlier. If I ask you to write a Python program to reverse a string and if you translate your C program into Python, it will be about 10 to 15 lines. It is only one line in Python. So that is what it means to be, to write a Pythonic code, to take advantage of all these features that Python provides you. Okay. What if I say a 1 colon 6 minus 1? I get an empty string. Why is that? Because when you put a negative index, what happens? If I start from a of 1, proceed in the reverse direction, it, it's, but the reverse direction is 0, right? But the problem is that when you put a negative index, 1 and 6 lose their original meaning. So earlier 1 was the lower bound and 6 was the upper bound. Now it's swapped. So I want to, so 6 is now the end, but there's no way I'll ever reach the end if I go from 1 towards the negative direction. So Python's behavior is to give you an empty string. Don't ask me why, that's how the creators made it. But just be careful when using negative indices, just be careful with how you choose your i and j. They should also be swapped. So a61 one minus 1 would be, it would give you the required result, but not a16 minus 1. Okay. 
So let's uh, discuss objects and methods. So here's a very crude introduction on what objects are. They are just chunks of memory, but with well-defined behavior imposed on them. So the integer 2 that we saw was an object. The float 2.0 was an object. The string hello was an object. All these are objects, and they have well-defined behavior. Because 2 into 3 will give you one result. 2 into 3.0 will give you another result and hello plus world gives you another result and hello into world gives no result at all. So these are rules that these blocks of memory, hello world 2, 2.0, 3, etc. are obeying. So that's what objects are. They are just blocks of memory with well-defined behavior as to what you can do with them and how they will behave when they interact with other objects through various operators. Okay, so when you make an object, there are functions which are attached to that object in some sense, which perform various operations on it. Okay, these are called methods. They are not called functions in this. Uh, to, to distinguish them from ordinary functions, which accept arguments and give an answer, from the functions which are attached to objects and manipulate them. So the latter are called methods. And to use a method, one types the name of the object, followed by a dot, the name of the method, and the arguments in the bracket. So let's see some string methods in action. So here is a string. And I'll say a dot title. Can you tell me what has happened here? How is the output generated? It's just capitalizing the first letter of every word. So it's switching, it's transforming the string to what we call the title case, where the first letter of every word is capitalized. But hey, hold on. This the brackets are empty. So I didn't give any arguments to it. So how did it know which string to take and transform into title case? Yes. So that's the key difference between methods and functions. The first default argument of any method is the object from which you are calling it. So when I say a dot title, title has already received an argument which is a. It may or may not require additional arguments, but the first argument will always be a. So it is taking a and transforming it into title case. I can also say a dot split and a comma in quotes. What is this doing? It is splitting the string at every comma that it can find. So it is now giving me three strings. How did it split? Using the comma as a separator. Okay. A dot strip. Can you tell me what this is doing? It is removing spaces from the beginning and the end of the string. There is also there are also two more methods called L strip and R strip. So if you want to specifically remove white spaces on the left, you use L strip, and if you only want to remove on the right, you use R strip. Now, here is a very important concept. Strings are immutable objects. What we mean by that is if a string is represented as a collection of zeros and ones in memory, that collection cannot be manipulated. It is sort of read only. You can't change it in place. So let's see how that works. If I say print a, I, I'm just checking what the value of a is. Now, I expect that a dot title is transforming the string into title case. But when I actually print a again, I get, and yes, this is the output, but if I print a, I get back the same string, the unchanged string. Why? Because a dot title is not changing the existing string. It is using that string to generate a new one. So you will have to capture that in a variable by saying b equal to a dot title. And you will have to say print b. And then this will be your transform string. 
Okay. If I make any attempts of changing the existing string by something like a of 3 equals x, this will not work. Python says the string object does not support item assignment. What that means is you cannot change the string in place. Yes, you can use that string to construct a new one and store it in another variable, but you cannot change the actual string in place. So that's called immutability. And again, if A is a string and you want to know all the methods available for A, you can do the same thing. You can say print dir of A. Again, there's a whole bunch of underscore variables that are special. But what we are interested is from here, capitalize, center, count, etc. Again, in IPython, it's much easier. Just have to type A dot and tab. And these are the functions or the methods rather available. So if I want to know what find does, I just say find, put a question mark, and it tells me what find does. Right. Okay, so that's all I have for today. So if you have any questions, yes. What would you do with them? I don't know. Let's see. There are. So it turns out that the integers can also store complex numbers. So you have methods to extract the real part, the imaginary part, and so on, which I'm not covering into. I'm not sure how many people often use these features. But yes, you have some methods for integers as well. Maybe even for floats, they might be separate. Let's see. Yes. A few more for float. But they are hardly used. They are provided, but very few programmers usually tend to use these methods. Because there are equivalents available in NumPy and SciPy. And since people are using those anyway, there is no real need to use these kind of methods. One very important uh, thing you must get used to when programming in Python is the workflow. How do you write a Python program? You open a text editor, you start typing whatever algorithm you want to type down in Python. Every time you are stuck, you have a IPython window opened on the side and you are testing pieces of code, you are using dot tab completion, etc., checking the documentation, deciding your syntax and incrementally adding code into the text editor. So if you're using this workflow, you don't really need uh, a special environment for developing Python programs. So that's why IDEs for Python were not something people were worried about developing. They, ha they are there, but you don't really need them. And how many of you use Vim? Okay, so you must check out a few presentations online. If you just say Vim as a Python ID on Google, there are a whole bunch of articles written by people where you can install plugins into Vim that can help convert Vim into an ID. So features like having a vertical split window on the right which shows you all the files in your current folder and automatic completion of syntax by linking Vim with IPython there are many pro Vim plugins that let you do that. So if you like Vim and want to use it in even a better way for Python, then you should just Google for these, uh, this statement, Vim as a Python ID, and you'll get a whole bunch of guides as to what plugins to install to do that. Anything else? Okay, so Yogesh has already shown you about the IPython notebook. So the presentation which I have used, the slides that I have used here, the exact the notebook version of the same will also be made available on the web page. So you can actually op use a, open it in the IPython notebook and directly edit the syntax and actually try and 
trial and error the heck out of it. I mean, and learn as much as you can. Yes. We have muted them, I guess. They have muted them. Okay. Yeah. If you have any questions, you can ask them. You'll have to unmute your mic first. Yeah, no, you absolutely need to install. If you are using Linux, then Python will already be installed. Uh, you can just open a terminal. Uh. Okay. I think it should ship by default, but I'll have to double check since yeah. I don't use Windows. We don't use Windows, so we don't know for sure, but we can check. But I think Anaconda is a proper distribution, so it should have uh, IPython already yes. included. But no, no, that's okay. But if IPython is there, then underlying Python interpreter is already there. You can't run IPython okay. without Python. So whatever you need is uh, is there already. Anything else? Yeah, so we will have one more talk tomorrow. Okay? Yes. So the next class will be tomorrow, same time, six thirty PM. And uh, by tomorrow we'll also give you the Toshido exercise and the Yeah. It's an easy assignment. Yes. Okay. Thank you.